In today's episode, we've got some huge news to discuss concerning SN3's current state of affairs. But we'll also get into some pretty nifty details that were released concerning the rocket. Then we'll discuss Crew Dragon updates, go over today's honorable mentions, then finish with a brand spanking new segment for these episodes. I am the Kevinator, and this is SpaceX in the News. Lots of Starship stuff to go over today, so let's get right into it. On Sunday, SpaceX moved SN3 stacked propellant tanks out of the high bay and transported it down Highway 4 to its test stand. And once it was there, they placed it upon three hydraulic rams that would be used to simulate Raptor engine thrust during the coming tests. You know, like they did for SN2. So the week did start off with what appeared to be a clear vision for the coming test schedule, but quickly delved into chaos as road closures were scheduled, then canceled, then rescheduled again. But that's just how it goes when you're going Mach 3 on the front lines of innovation with your hair on fire. And speaking of being on the front lines, Elon was on site, as he has been these last several weeks, taking upskirt pictures of SN3, and they were quite revealing. What seemed to grab everyone's attention were her legs, to which he explained they extend and telescope out, so are longer than they seem, but not as long as they will be for SN4. If you remember back a couple weeks ago, Elon basically said Starship has little chicken legs and that they were going to upgrade them. And when asked if this rendering was pretty close to what he had in mind, Elon responded, yes, but those are version 0.9 legs, so major upgrades are coming. Need wider span, longer stroke, and ability to auto level for uneven ground or leaning into high winds. Uneven ground is an issue that I personally can heavily relate to. No, yes, no, no, no. Definitely need a wider span. Another visual created by Stanley Creative provides a similar but alternative method that might be used to deploy the legs. The most important thing to take away from all of this is that these legs are already attached to SM3, which shows us how serious SpaceX was getting about the upcoming 150 meter hop. And yeah, I said was, but we'll get to that. SpaceX did manage to sneak in a pressure test on Wednesday night, which none of us were even aware happened, despite watching Lab Padre's livestream. And then yesterday afternoon, they did it a second time, completing over an hour's worth of gaseous nitrogen pressure testing, to which I tweeted out a dumb joke that, you know, some people just didn't get. But we'll get back to that. A few hours later, SpaceX then filled SN3's vessel up with liquid nitrogen for cryo testing. But that test quickly came to a halt, leaving many fans to speculate what happened. That is until Elon, for the first time ever, tweeted me personally with the answers. <laughs> See, Elon got my joke. The guy's a good sport. He said they were having leaky valve troubles during the cryo test, but that they are working on it and will be retesting soon. And that they did. At two o'clock this morning, as Elon and the Boca Chica engineers were pressurizing SN3 with super chilled nitrogen, or LN2, the structure caved from rapid loss of pressure. So I guess SN3 does suck after all. Poopy. But cheer up guys, again, this is the front line of innovation. Failure is a solid teaching tool. You know, so long as you're not insane, according to Einstein. Elon said they will have to review the data, but it may have been caused by a test configuration mistake. So on to SN4 we go, which is already well under construction. Earlier I said that the attachment of SN3's legs was a sign from SpaceX of their intention to do the 150 meter hop. Now I'd like to submit before the court another piece of evidence that tells us that SpaceX is super seriously about Starship's future. You're not a lawyer! The official Starship user guide. Get yours now. And no, it's not an April Fool's gag. SpaceX releases these for all their rockets. And this one, gentlemen, is one of the few user guides out there that you should probably read. It's quite interesting. But don't worry if you don't like to read, I already did it for you. And these are the important parts that I took away from it. First off, the purpose of this Starship user guide is to inform potential customers about payload accommodations. And this of course is just the first copy. More will follow as customers provide their feedback. The guide goes over two different versions of Starship, both the crewed and uncrewed spaceships. We'll begin with the uncrewed. These Starships are capable of transporting over 100 metric tons of mass to low Earth orbit and 21 tons to geostationary transfer orbit, which is much higher. But none to the Moon or to Mars, unless a Starship to Starship propellant transfer is done in low Earth orbit, in which case just make it 100 plus metric tons across the entire board to wherever the customer wants to go. You know, so as long as it's not further than Mars, I guess. Elon did admit to a little humility to these numbers, and that eventually Starship will be capable of 150 tons to LEO, which is more than the Saturn V could ever dream of. Keep in mind that all these numbers include the assumption that Starship will be reusable. Payload integration will happen at launch sites Kennedy Space Center and Boca Chica, but how it will be done is still kind of a mystery. 
Payloads will be placed into a Starship fairing before being placed onto the Starship vehicle itself, already stacked on the launch pad. But here you can see the fairing is clearly attached to the nose of Starship. Maybe they have recently changed something about the design, or they mean something else entirely when they say fairing. I don't know. But regardless, Starship will transport satellites, large observatories, cargo, refueling tanks, and other unnamed assets. And if multiple of these are on board, a rotating mechanism can be provided to allow each one to separate with maximum clearance. As far as the crewed Starship configuration is concerned, it is still expected to transport up to 100 people from Earth to orbit, and will include private cabins, large common areas, centralized storage for food, water, and DVDs, as well as a storm shelter to protect passengers from bursts of dangerous radiation during solar flares, and a viewing gallery, which are all of those windows you see in the tip of the nose there. Have fun on your journey, you bunch of window lickers. But you know, that still kind of seems kind of cramped to me, despite Starship's wide girth. We do know that eventually Elon does want to quadruple the size of Starship, <laughs> which is massive, and that would allow for definitely 100 people to live comfortably. But this here user guide is for the 9 meter diameter Starship. But you know what, it doesn't really matter right now anyway, because it's going to be quite some time before SpaceX sends 100 people to Mars. They would, of course, start out with smaller groups of teams on Starship. And so by the time they need to send 100, you know, hopefully non claustrophobic people to Mars, they'll have that quadruple sized sardine can ready to go. And lastly, Starship will also be used to capture satellites already in orbit and repair them. This would also include space junk cleanup as well. Now let's move on to the Dragon. First off, Elon did respond to last week's revealing of Dragon XL, a future descendant of Cargo Dragon that will ride upon a Falcon Heavy to deliver five metric tons to lunar orbit. Some people were concerned the news didn't bode well for Starship's future with Artemis, but Elon tweeted that hopefully Starship will have enough flight time to take Dragon's place for NASA missions as well. And speaking of NASA, they still don't seem to be all too concerned about last week's Crew Dragon mishap that occurred just prior to a drop test, saying, quote, We are looking at the parachute testing plan now, as well as all the data we already have to determine the next steps ahead of flying the upcoming Demo 2 flight test in the mid to late May timeframe. And they've been following up that statement this week with more proof of their intentions to press forward, tweeting images of Bob and Doug completing a series of mission simulations from launch to landing as well as the first photos of them in the very Dragon capsule they'll be flying in. And they also announced two more crew members to the first official Crew Dragon mission that will launch sometime after Demo 2. NASA astronaut Shannon Walker has been assigned to Crew 1, and so has Japanese Space Agency astronaut Soichi. I bet I nailed that one. Crew 1 is expected to launch sometime later this year. And now it's time for today's honorable mentions. NASA and Jim Bridenstine announced that the worm is back, and the iconic NASA logo is going to be placed on the Falcon 9 boosters for Demo 2. We all know what the meatball is, but in the 70s it was too difficult to produce and print, so this cleaner, simpler, and sleeker design joined the ranks as one of NASA's official symbols in 1975. However, in 1992, the brand was retired, except for merchandise of course, and the meatball was once again the logo of choice. I like meatballs. But since that honorable mention was kind of short, I got a bonus one for you. And it's me! After years of playing Kerbal Space Program, I finally decided to try my hand at building a rover. Inspired by the seven minutes of terror that Curiosity went through during its Martian descent in 2012, I attempted to land my rover on the other red planet, Duna. And I gotta say, now I'm addicted to the game all over again. It was quite a fun and challenging experience for this hooplehead. I highly recommend you try it yourself. You can show me what you got on Twitter, game on. All right, since the next generation is currently stuck at home learning with mom and pop, I thought I'd give the situation a little bit of Kevin flavor with our new segment, where I take questions from our inquisitive young students who love space. Brings me back to the good old days of shouting down high schoolers in my science lab. Great times. Welcome to Kevin's classroom. No yelling on the bus! Hey Kevin, my name's Dylan and I'm from Mississippi. My first question is, what are velocities required to stay in orbit around Mars? And my second question is, if you were offered a ride to the space station or to the moon as a commercial astronaut, would you take it? Thanks and bye. Yo, Dill man, thank you so much for the good questions. You know, especially that math one. There's nothing that makes me regret this decision more. I'm, I'm just kidding. All right. So uh, I think what you may be referring to is was what we call station keeping, which is the orbital speed necessary to stay in orbit around a celestial body. I believe that may also be called aerosynchronous orbit. And you know, the exact number I think you're looking for really comes down to the altitude you're at. 
as you probably already know, the lower your orbit is, the faster your velocity. So if you look at the equation at hand, I, I, at least I believe this is the right equation. It's been some time since I've had my teacher's edition of the physical science textbook. We have velocity equals the square root of the gravitational constant times the mass, in this case of Mars, divided by basically the distance you're orbiting Mars at from the center of the planet. So we'll skip plugging in a bunch of different altitude variables and call it between three and five clicks per second on average. Some people call it kilometers, some people call it kilometers. I like to call it clicks with a K just to make them both mad. You guys in the comments can feel free to critique my math. I know you will, but please be gentle. It's my first time and I'm trying to do good things here. And Dylan, to answer your second question, absolutely. That was much easier. Thanks a lot for your questions, Dill man. D Dill man, Dill. Dill, Dill Pickles, mm, I'm hungry now. All right, since this is our first segment of Kevin's Classroom, I'm gonna make it special and do another question video. Because I can, I make the rules. Hi Kevin, I love your page. How many stars are in our galaxy and how do astronauts get their food, food supply? How does my pilot suit look with my model walking? Great questions, you guys. And I especially appreciate the parachute question. So let's start off with that one because I love shoots. Elijah, the parachute in that awesome Falcon 9 rocket of yours actually works because of this. This is what we call in the model rocketry industry, uh, a motor, or you can call it an engine if you want. And the way it works is you stick that fuse in there on the launch stand, you click that button that you like to do, and it goes That's the exact sound it makes. <laughs> okay, and as it's soaring through the air, it's soaring, it's soaring, all right? And that powder's burning, it's burning, until it finally gets to the delay charge. The delay charge is up here, all right? And that's when you start seeing the smoke trail come out the bottom and it starts to arch over uh, on its apogee, uh, the highest point in its, in its suborbital trajectory. Uh, these, these, I, I just realized these words are pretty fancy for a five-year-old. Uh, I'm not used to teaching five-year-olds. Okay, we're just gonna roll with it. <laughs> we'll get to the parachutes here in a minute. There's the method to my madness. So it hits the delay charge. Okay, so the delay charge is burning, producing all the smoke. As it starts to come down, that delay charge is now all eaten up as well. And the and the fire, the heat gets to the explosive charge, all right? And this has to go somewhere, right? So all this hot gas goes flowing through, through your tube until it gets to your parachute. Now, hopefully you have something between the parachute and the heat where it will destroy your parachute. And if your parachute fails, your rocket fails and it goes kaput, right? So the hot gas goes somewhere, it goes out this end, it travels up the tube, pushing out the wadding, which, uh, protects your parachute, or in this case, I have a, a piston. Piston comes out and smells, and then the parachute deploys, and from there, gravity and drag take over. You'll learn about those terms, what, I don't know, fifth grade maybe? <laughs> so short answer to your question, gravity and drag. Write that down. And Isla, you asked how do astronauts get their food in space? That's a really good question, and the way they do it is on rockets, actually. So if you ever watch a SpaceX launch to the International Space Station, you'll see what we call a cargo dragon on top of a Falcon 9 rocket. And inside that dragon is supplies and that includes dehydrated food, which just means it's really dry, yummy. And your second question is how many stars are there in the galaxy? A lot, All right, we're talking billions upon billions. A billion is a huge number. I want you to think about this for a second. If the day you were born, not, the, not just the day, if the second you were born, you started counting, which would be impressive if you could count the second you were born. But if you started counting to 1 billion the second you were born, it would take you till almost your 32nd birthday to reach 1 billion. That's a lot of seconds. That's a lot of counting. And we're just talking 1 billion seconds. In the galaxy, we're talking billions and billions of stars. You better start counting those stars if you wanna name them all. And you know, fun Kevin fact for you, I was actually looking forward to celebrating my 1 billionth second birthday or birth second, I guess. Uh, for about 10 years, I look forward to that. I wrote down the date on a piece of paper and carried it around with me for years. Once I finally got a smartphone, I just transferred that information onto the phone. And when I switched phones, I transferred that information to my next phone. So uh, I was gonna make a big deal out of it because I'd never heard of anybody celebrating that before. And then when I was like 31 and a half years old and the time came, I totally forgot about it. But anyway, I had a great time answering your questions. Thank you so much for submitting them. Those of you that submitted one this week, I didn't get to it. Uh, I apologize, but rest assured, I still have your question and we're gonna keep the segment going. So maybe I can get to it in the future. If you'd like to submit a question, check out the description in the link below. Come on my show. Thank you all so much for tuning in and a very special shout out and thank you to my eccentric members and patrons who actually gave me the idea for the classroom segment. If you're craving more Kevin or maybe just some SpaceX news, then check out the links below. I'll see you all next week and until that time, 
Godspeed.